to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Welcome to our study of Do You Really Want to Go to Heaven? We talk about heaven, we sing about it, we pray about it, we study about it, but do you really want to go to heaven? You know, if we were to ask this question by putting the emphasis on different words, I, I think it would help us to understand the importance of the question a little more. For example, we could say, do you really want to go to heaven? We're not asking, do you want your family to go to heaven? Do you want your wife to go to heaven? Do you want your friends to go to heaven? This is an individual matter. Do you want to go to heaven? And it's individual because each of us must make the choice for himself. Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. We could ask the question by asking, do you really want to go to heaven? Not do you maybe want to a little bit or do you have that sort of a desire? Or is it something you ought to want? But do you really? Is this your heart's desire? Is this what you're seeking to do? Is this your main goal in this life? Then we can ask, do you really want to go to heaven? Going requires action on our part. There is something I must do. There is a journey I must take. There is a walk I must walk if I'm going to get there. And so there are things along the way that must be done. But finally, we would ask it by saying, do you really want to go to heaven? That beautiful home of the soul. That place where there'll be no more weeping or sorrow or death. Do you really want to go to that place? It's sad, but some are not ready for heaven or they'd live better. There are some who maybe think about it and even sing about it and they come to worship, but their lives are a clear example. They don't want to go to heaven. Let's think for just a moment about why some are going to miss heaven. Some are going to miss heaven because they underestimate the power of Satan. Satan is going to do everything possible to try to get me to miss heaven and to try to get you to miss heaven, and we've got to be on guard. Look at what Jesus said in Luke twenty-two thirty-one concerning Satan. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But then Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith will not falter or fail. Uh, Jesus wanted Peter to realize Satan has got you at this point right where he wants you and he's sifting you just like wheat. We've got to be aware of the tactics or the trials that the devil may throw out of out at us. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11. We've got to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to resist Satan. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. We've got to realize that he is a conniving individual. He'll do whatever it takes to make sure that I miss heaven. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7, and we must resist him steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter 5 verses 7 through 9. As we think about Satan, some advice that we could give is don't even let Satan have a place in your life. Ephesians 4 27, don't give the devil a foothold, don't give the devil a place in your life. Don't open that door, don't even go there, don't let him in the front door. Make sure that Satan stays out of your life. He is that dragon who when he becomes a part of your life will wreak havoc in every area of it. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9 describes him as that roaring ravenous lion looking to tear apart in whatever way he may. He is that diabolical demon, untamed like the wild stallion, goes where it wants, does what it wants under nobody's control. Do you want that in your life? He's that subtle serpent. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 uses the idea of angel of light. 
Here he is in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, and he just makes a few changes. Did God really say you couldn't? Well, why did God do that? God didn't really mean it, did he? And before you know it, they've eaten of the forbidden fruit, and death comes to mankind. He's always seen as an active adversary, one who is trying to control my life and one who's trying to control yours. He's that crafty chameleon. He can shift himself to whatever our weakness may be. Maybe my weakness is this. Well, Satan is going to make sure he uses that against me. One thing about the devil, he knows what my weakness is and he knows what your weakness is and he'll surely use those against us. And so don't let Satan keep you from missing heaven. Remember, he went about to and fro, back and forth on the earth in the book of Job. He was looking for people to cause to be lost. But Job won the battle against Satan by being faithful to God and not giving up. Some are going to miss heaven because of the separation that sin brings. Oh, how sad it is to see members of the body of Christ People live in sin and die in that sin. We know the scriptures teach they're going to miss out on the beauty of heaven. Remember the old verse, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. It teaches us why people who are in sin will miss heaven. Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. When I bring sin into my life and when you bring sin into your life, we become separated from God. When we think about the destructive nature of sin and why some are going to miss heaven, how sad it is when a child of God gives up on heaven because of sin, or how sad it is when people in this world give themselves to sin instead of God. You see, all unrighteousness is sin. First John chapter 5 and verse 16. Sin itself is lawlessness. It is the absence of law in my life. But not only is sin unrighteousness, not only is sin lawlessness, but a failure to do the right thing is also sin. James 4 verse 17, James said, For him that knows to do good and does not do it, it is a sin. And see, here's the sad result of sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 teaches, and the wages, the salary of that sin, is death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And you can be sure, your sins will find you out. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. How we need to encourage one another daily. Hebrews 3 verse 12. How we need to exhort each other not to let sin overcome us, but to keep fighting the battle against sin. Some are also going to miss heaven because of the foolish excuses people often use. You know, when I think of excuses, none could be worse than the ones found in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 18, notice says, they all with one accord began to make excuses. Well, I've bought a piece of land and I can't come. Uh, I've married a wife and I can't come. I've got this excuse and I can't come. Well, those are all excuses. I've got this land, I gotta check it out. Wait, it's supper time. You're not gonna go check it at supper time. You're gonna eat somewhere. I've married a wife. That's the worst excuse of all. How many newlyweds do you know that can pass up a free meal? They were just making excuses. They weren't really putting their heart in doing the will of God. Oftentimes people do make excuses for not obeying the gospel. Go away for now. When I've got a more convenient time, I'll call upon you. Acts chapter 24, verse 25. Sadly, that day may never have come for Felix. He needed to obey the gospel and do what was right. Acts chapter 26, verse 28, Agrippa said, almost, almost, you persuade me to become a Christian. Paul said, I wish that you were almost and all together as I am without these chains. You've got too many who are, I'll do it tomorrow, and too many almost. But that won't help anybody get to heaven. We need more like those in Acts chapter 2. When they heard the word, they obeyed it immediately. We need more like Philip who've got the urgency to run over and teach the gospel to those who are lost. Also, we must realize that some are going to be lost because of parents who don't care. 
how sad it is that we're raising or some are being raised by parents who really don't care, who haven't given their children a head start so that they can go to heaven. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 15, that children are to be raised and to be taught so that they can know the will of God. John looked at his converts in 3 John 4 and he thought of them as my little children. We need people who love children, who want to train them, and who want to help them get to heaven. We need more people who realize, as Psalm 127 verses 1 through 3 teaches, children are a gift from God. Children are not a nuisance. They're not something to be pushed aside. They're one of the best privileges and gifts you can ever have. And we need more parents like John the Immerser's parents. Luke chapter 1 verse 6 of Zacharias and his wife, it says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the statutes and commandments of the Lord, blameless. They wanted to do right. They did it themselves. And they taught John to be that way. John had a head start above others because his parents were godly parents. Some are going to be lost and miss out on heaven because they're just keeping house. They've just got that external church house religion and it goes no further than the doors of the church. Mark chapter 7, Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. Jesus said of people like that, He spoke of them as hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about this people saying, They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. There are so many who have yet to really be converted to the cross of Christ. They're, they're the great pretenders. They dress like it. They look like it. They talk like it. But in all honesty, doing it, feels like a chore to them. They've yet to experience the joy of seeking after the Lord with your whole heart. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. I'm reminded of the words of Jeremiah 7 and verse 4. Jeremiah cried out, or the people cried out, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. What were they saying? Save us, O our sanctuary. The sanctuary didn't save them then. The temple didn't save them then. And having just an external church house religion is not going to save anybody today. You've got to be fully committed to the cause of Christ. Well, what is it that will help people to really be committed to obeying the gospel, to going to heaven and becoming a Christian? I believe if we can realize the beauty and the splendor of that place called heaven, we wouldn't do anything to miss it. Job asked a question in the long ago. In Job 14, verse 14, Job said, If a man dies, shall he live again? We come down the span of history, and that answer is not clearly given until Jesus comes on the scene. John chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, Jesus there says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, he who believes in me will never really die. Do we realize the beauty of that place called heaven, the hope of the resurrection? Psalm 23, that God will be our leader, that he will shepherd us to green pastures, to rivers of water, and that will be no want for us. Do we realize that it's that place of rest and hope and joy? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 describes heaven as a place of rest. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. We need to realize that this is that place Jesus spoke of when he motivated his disciples to live faithful to him. I want you to notice the words of John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Jesus said in John 14 verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. They said, Lord, we don't know the way, and Jesus said, I am the way. But look at the beauty. Jesus said, I've got to leave, but I'm going to prepare the way, and where I'm going, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to receive you, and you're going to go with me. Don't you want to go 
to that beautiful hay place, that, that place made without hands, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 following, that place when the Lord comes, we'll meet Him in the air and we'll always be with the Lord. As 2 Thessalonians 1 says, it is that, that great day, that day to be admired that we look forward to. It is that day of reckoning for God when He will call His people to His own. Psalm 24 teaches us to open up our eyes and look at the gates. There's the picture of Christians, not getting focused on the world, but looking up to heaven. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. That's where our heart and our mind needs to be, on heaven itself. Do you realize today the beauty of that place? Romans 8.18 describes it this way. Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present world, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know what Paul's saying? The trouble, the trial, the difficulty that we face, whatever we go through, won't even be a drop in the bucket compared to how beautiful heaven will be. Heaven will truly be worth it all. It is that place where God Himself is. What makes heaven beautiful? It's not the streets of gold. It's not the, the pearly gates. It's not necessarily the tree of life. Heaven is going to be great because God is there. Matthew 6, verse 9, we're to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. God is the source of all love. 1 John 4, verse 8. God is the source of light. 1 John 1, verse 7. And if we can be in the presence of God forever, that's what makes heaven that beautiful place. You know, I think of the beauty and the splendor of heaven. There's the absence of certain things that will also make heaven great. Think about Revelation 21, verse 4. Heaven's a place where there'll be no more sorrow, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. All the former things have passed away. Don't you want to go to a place where Kleenex would go out of business? There won't be any more need for that. Sorrow will pass away. No more pain. Don't you look forward to the day when you won't hurt anymore, when the old physical body won't have control of you at times. No more sorrow. I won't ever have to go to a funeral and cry at the casket of a loved one. No more death. All of that will cease to exist. All the former things that cause us so much problems in the here and now is what's going to make heaven that great place. The absence of those is going to make heaven that great place. Well, if we're going to go to heaven, if you really want to go to heaven, there are some warning signs that you've got to listen to. Some warning signs you've got to give heed to if you're going to be ready to go to heaven. We've got to make sure that we listen to what God says concerning this. Our citizenship is in heaven, Peter said in Philippians, or Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 20. We've got to do what it takes, even if it means to suffer, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, to get there, and we've got to strive diligently to go to that place. Well, what warning signs do we need to watch out for? There's the warning sign that says, if you're going to go to heaven, do not enter here. Notice the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want you to look in verse 33. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. If I'm going to make it to heaven, I've got to realize I can't run with ungodly people. I can't let ungodly people influence me. I've got to make sure that I don't get bogged down in sin and let those people influence me. You remember Samson? Samson let peer pressure of those around him, of his wife, cause him to make horrible decisions, and it, he suffered greatly because of it. We need to realize that it is God who must make us, who must be the motivating factor in the decisions that we make. Here's some people not to hang around with. Don't hang around with drunkards, with people who get caught up in wine and alcohol. Don't even hang around those type of people. The Bible says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever's led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. The Bible teaches Christians to be sober-minded. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 2 through 4. The Bible says, do not be drunken with wine. If you hang around with people who do that, e even though you say, well, I'm not going to do it, isn't that still affecting your influence? 
The Bible says you're to be a shining light to the world, to bring others to Jesus. If you're around that and you don't speak out against it and you don't stand up for what's right, what kind of influence will you have? Second warning sign says, danger, watch out. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 teaches us we must be on the guard. The Bible says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I've got to make sure that I'm always on the alert, that I'm watching out to make sure that I'm living the way God wants me to. You see, friend, it's the person who thinks he's right where he needs to be that the devil is the one who's got a hold of. We need to never think we've attained. Philippians 3, verses 10 through 12, Paul said, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When Jesus spoke to the church in Laodicea, he said, You're neither hot nor cold. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. Why? Because they were lukewarm. They weren't watching out. They had grown tepid and they weren't what they should have been. And thus the Lord was not pleased with them. We need to be on fire for serving God. Luke chapter 24. We need to have that burning fire that Jeremiah had in his heart and that fire comes from the Word of God which is the source of our fire. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29. Then there's another sign, another warning sign that we need to heed and that is the sign that says, slow down. Sometimes we get going through life so fast and you've got so many things going at one time and you've got so many fingers and so many pies that we really don't even know which way we're going. Slow down and see that I am God. Psalm 46 and verse 10, God says, we need to take heed lest there be in any of us an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We, we need to give God the glory and the honor and take time to praise Him in this life. Jude verses 21 through 24. And then in slowing down, we need to take the time to do a little self-examination. Test yourselves to see whether you are in the faith examine yourselves. When I slow down and when I think about my relationship with God and how I can make it grow, how I can make it better, one of the things I need to do is slow down and let God have better control of my life. Stop the worrying, stop the complaining, Philippians 2.14, Matthew 6.24, and just let God lead me through His Word. But then there's another sign, probably one of the most important signs of all, and this sign says crossroads ahead. Each one of us has to stand at the crossroads and make a decision of which way we're going to go. There are only two choices that can be made. Notice the words of Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are two ways. One is the broad way, one is the wide gate, and it's easy to go down, and most people are going down that path. The majority are. It's an easy road. It's a popular road. The, the peer pressure doesn't exist. Everybody's doing the same thing. You'll be happy. Your friends will be happy, you think but it's not the way that leads to life that you want. It leads to destruction. Now, what do we mean by this path leads to destruction? The scripture teaches there is a far greater destruction than we may ever begin to imagine in this life. If a person goes down the wrong road, they will spend eternity with the devil in hell forever. Now, think about what that's going to be like. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus described that place called hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. For the comfort, you mourn continuously, and if anyone tried to help, it's as though they would gnash the teeth at them. That's the only hope you've got. It is a place of eternal torment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. It is a place of fire. The Bible describes it in Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, as a place where the fire does not stop burning and the man wanted just one, the rich man wanted just one drop of water to cool his tongue. Can you imagine that? Would anybody in the right mind today take a lighter and just hold their finger over that? 
Well, of course not. That would hurt. We wouldn't want to do that now. But can you imagine living that way for all eternity? But now let's look at the other side. Jesus said there is also a narrow path, a restricted way, and it's the road that few are going down, and it's the road that leads to eternal life. From this we learn that to do God's will, you've got to go against the grain of what most people are doing. You can't just go along with the crowd. You've got to do what's right because the Bible teaches that it is right. And remember, it's the place that few are going down and it leads to eternal life. Don't you want to live with God forever? Don't you want to be in that place called heaven, that place of beauty and splendor? Can you imagine being around the throne of God and worshiping Him forever? Can you imagine being with that great heavenly host, the saints of old? Can you imagine seeing loved ones who've gone on before you and never having to fear for loss of them again? That's the beauty of that place we call heaven. And so we ask you again, do you really want to go to heaven? We're not asking, do you kind of want to go there? We're asking today, are you serious? Is going to heaven your most important goal in this life? Friend, it must be. It must be the thing you're seeking the most. Someone says, well, I do want to go to heaven, but I'm not sure I'm on the right road. Here's how you can know you're a child of God and know you're on the road to heaven. You can know the truth and the truth will make you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus teaches us that to become a Christian, we must hear the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. We must be willing to believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. John chapter 8, verse 24. We must make changes in our life and repent. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. And you must make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And having done that, you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, when we talk about baptism, we want you to see that baptism is essential to salvation. The scriptures teach, according to Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Saul was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. And so do you really want to go to heaven? More than anything do you want to go to heaven. Will you obey the gospel to go to heaven? We hope and pray today that you'll do thus just that as you seek to go to that wonderful place called heaven. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.